Amen. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you on this beautiful day. Let's grab our blue songbook and go to number 341. Number 341. We'll sing the first, second, and the fourth verse of Pentecostal power. Let's all stand and stretch. So we're going to open our service. Number 341, Pentecostal power. Join me on the first. Lord, as of old at Pentecost, thou didst thy power display with cleansing, purifying flame, descend on us today. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power. Thy floodgates of blessing on us throw open wide. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, that sinners be converted and thy name glorified. For mighty works for thee prepare and strengthen every heart. Come take possession of thine own and never more depart. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power. Thy floodgates of blessing on us throw open wide. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, that sinners be converted and thy name glorified. Speak, Lord, before thy throne we wait, thy promise we believe, and will not let thee go until the blessing we receive. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, Thy floodgates of blessing on us throw open wide. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power. May sinners be converted and thy name glorified. Amen. Praise the Lord. May that be our prayer. May that be our prayer. And that God would give us that Pentecostal power. Amen. Amen. Let's open up with a word of prayer and uh, we will continue. Brother Enos, do you mind praying for us, please? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Number 260. Go to number 260. Number 260. Number 260. He is able to deliver thee. Let's sing all three verses. Number 260. He is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme through the ages wrong. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee on the second. Tis the grandest theme in the earth for me. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strength. Tis the grandest theme till the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though my sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. 
Tis the grandest theme, let the tidings roam to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee, he is able to deliver thee, he is able to deliver thee. Though my sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Amen. What a great God we serve. Amen. 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 Let's go to the announcements right quick. And then uh, if somebody wants to give a testimony in just a second on how good God has been to you this week, if you would be thinking of that. We will uh, enjoy to hear it. Amen. Don't forget to be in prayer and also be ready for the chili cook-off coming at the end of this uh, next month, October, October 27th. Friday, October 27th is our annual chili cook-off. All right. So dust off your chili recipes, practice them, get them fine-tuned because it's intense and fierce competition. You've got a six-year-old boy who wants to take home the trophy again. He wants to take it home again and again and again. He's like his mother. I mean, did I say that out loud? Did I say that out loud? Oops, I'm sorry. Don't play Miss Melissa in the game. She, she turns into, you know, you know how uh, Saul, whenever he was told he was going to be king, he, t he turned into another. Anyways, yes. no, just kidding. Just kidding. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. So I let her, I let her beat me uh, just to, 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 to yeah. Anyways, we're going to have a good time. We're going to have a good time. That's coming up on October 27th, Chili Cook-Off, 6 p.m. here down at, downstairs at the church. And uh, we're looking forward to, to uh, having a good time, having a good supper together. want to wish Brother Tompkins a happy birthday this week. He's got a birthday coming up. And also, if you have Brother Tim Shepard's number, reach out to him. This week is his birthday as well. So be, uh, be, uh, reach out to him, and he would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Um, also, be in prayer for um, a teen rally coming up at Lake Crest Baptist Church. Lake Crest Baptist Church coming up October 14th. So uh, be in prayer about that. And, uh, and um, so we were, we're hoping that some of our bus kids that will be able to go with us. So uh, please, uh, I was hoping Brother Moog would be here to let him know. But uh, hopefully, uh, if he's listening on the live stream, he, he is uh, catching, catching this. You told him? Good. Good, because I uh, had a good time with, with him last year and with uh, the, the kids that came. Amen. Does anybody have a, a blessing that they would like to share? Something the Lord did for you this week and uh, you just like to, to share and praise the Lord for? Anybody? Anybody? Yes, sir, Brother Tompkins. Amen. Amen. Yes, yes. Jump on it. Yes, yes. Amen. Well, we hope and pray that God just slowly works on them and makes them hungry, hungry for something different. Amen. Thank you for being faithful over there to, to be ready to give an answer when the time comes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thanks for sharing that. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, Mrs. Ingram. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, well, amen. Well, amen. I've been praying for Brother Tony. Yeah, just kidding. <laughs> I am praying for Brother Tony, but not for that. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Glad you were able to enjoy it. Thanks for joining them. I know that it was a blessing to the, to the folks. Uh, they were talking about it this morning. They were talking about it this morning. Well, amen. Amen. Having a revival. Amen. <laughs> Even anybody else have a blessing they would like to share? Yes, Ms. Tompkins. Yes. Okay. Doesn't look a year over over fifty. Good. Yes. Oh, yes. Marshall Spun. That's great. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Have you gone to that uh, store in uh, Marshall with the pipe organ? They've got a pipe organ, and they'll turn it on for you. And, uh, Moles Hole. Moles Hole. We're going in there Thursday, so go to Moles Hole and ask them, hey, I heard about y'all's pipe organ. And you can actually look into the window and see all the inner workings of the pipe organ, and it will blow you away. It is, it is powerful. It is powerful. And, and just to hear it playing. They'll turn it on for you. It's, they have digital D, uh, CDs. And they'll just plug it into the computer, and it's all automated. So, Hope you enjoy your time. That's, that's fun. Marshall's a fun little town. That's where my wife and I spent our anniversary uh, this past summer at the National House Inn right there and uh, had the whole place to ourselves. So. Literally had the whole place to ourselves. It was great. It was great. Amen. We felt so spoiled by the Lord. Amen. Amen. Anybody else have a blessing you want to share? Yes, Brother Tony. Uh, I'd ask if you could pray for this uh, man down the road, Danny. Yes. A couple weeks ago, and Sunday morning, so I'm going to pick up the bus sometimes and take a walk down there. He's going to that Beagle Club down there. Mm hmm. Thrill seekers. <laughs> Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What an what a what an exciting story. Can't wait to hear how how the Lord uh, brings them to His kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody else have a blessing that you want to share? Yes. Praise the Lord. That's exciting. It's exciting. It's good to see you, Brother Mrs. Cox with us this evening. And you have some friends with, with you. Can you introduce who they are? Okay. Okay. Amen. Thanks for coming. Thanks for, so much for coming. Glad to have you here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else have a blessing that you would like to share? All right. If not, then let's stand, please, and let's go to number 401. Number 401, we'll sing the, all three verses of Set My Soul Afire, number 401. Number 401, we'll sing all three verses. Think about the words as you sing. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy holy word. Burn it deep within me, let your voice be heard. Millions grope in darkness in this day and hour. I will be your witness, fill me with thy power. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord, set 
set my soul afire, set my soul afire, Lord, for the lost in sin. Give to me a passion as I seek to win. Help me not to falter, never let me fail. Fill me with thy spirit, let thy will prevail. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Set my soul afire, Lord, in my daily life. For too long I wandered in this day of strife. Nothing else will matter but to live for Thee. I will be Your way. As you live in me, set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of my saving power. Millions grope in darkness. Waiting for thy word, set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul afire. Amen, amen. May it be our heart's anthem every day. Amen. Lord, set my soul afire. Amen. I love that chorus. Amen. Let's grab our Bibles. We're going to go to Hebrews, the book of Hebrews this evening for our scripture reading. Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, and we ask for the Tony if he would come and lead us in our scripture reading from Hebrews chapter 11. Good evening, open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll be reading verses 32 to 40. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 40. It's good seeing the, the Coxes here tonight. Brother Cox has been accompanying me to the men's Bible study for three years now, and he drives over an hour to get to my house on Thursday nights. So we go to downtown Jackson to do the men's Bible study. So, and even Miss Brenda has come down there too. So, good to, good to see you all and your guests. Welcome. Okay, I will begin, and you respond accordingly. And what shall and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of, and of Barak and of Samson and, and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, brought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Verse 40 together. 
God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, it's been a great day. We had a great service this morning, Lord. We thank you for yesterday, for the trip down to Sauter Village with the, with the bus riders. That was a blessing being, being there with them, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for our visitors tonight, Lord. Now we ask you to speak to our hearts, Lord. Challenge us tonight in a way we haven't been challenged. This chapter here, we call it the Hall of Faith. We would hope our names would be written in the Hall of Faith someday. They give me great encouragement to stand no matter the cost. We see all of our Bible heroes in here. We know they have flaws and they haven't done everything perfect, Lord, but they made it to the Hall of Faith. May we strive to have our names added there. We know we're in the book of life, Lord, but we want to have something that we've done for you when we meet you, Lord. We don't want to come empty-handed. Lord, challenge us tonight. Speak to our hearts. Increase our faith. May we not be cowards, Lord. May we not be cowards. May we stand in a, in a wicked and evil world that we see going on right now. Too many times we're quiet. We don't say anything. We're upset the way things are going. It's because we're not going. We're not going sharing the gospel as we should. We confess that tonight, Lord. Stir a fire in this, Lord, like we were singing tonight. Set my soul on fire. Set our souls on fire, Lord, that you can use us in a mighty way, that you get glory out of it, Lord. And the world stands in awe and wonders how we did that, Lord. May, that, may those times draw them to find that seek out the Savior, that they may find out what, what the eternity holds for them, Lord. We have the truth. May we not hide it. May we not hide our, our light under a bushel, our four no more. May we take it outside of here, Lord. We get trained up here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night to take out the gospel to our, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our workplace, to the schools, to the grocery store, to the men's Bible study in Jackson. Everywhere you send us, Lord, may we bring the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, the good tidings, how people can know they have a home in heaven, Lord, through Jesus Christ. Give our pastor what he needs tonight, Lord. Tonight, Lord. Fill him with the power of the Holy Spirit. Use him, Lord, in a way that, that touches our hearts, Lord, and moves our feet, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. What a very familiar passage and what an inspiring passage. If you've never gone through all of the people described in Hebrews chapter 11 and done a Bible study on their lives, I encourage you to do that and just to journal and learn and learn everything you can about each one of these people. And there were so many that were unmentioned. Verse 36, it says, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. I love what the Bible says about these people in verse 38. It says, in a, in a side comment, of whom the world was not worthy. You know, if the world is, is, if the world is going to persecute people who come in peace and want to to help people then the world is saying we're not worthy of you all and that's what the, that's what this the scripture is saying god's children they they come in peace they don't come jesus did not send us with send us with a sword he sent us with peace he sent us with the message of the gospel to give them a chance and if the world rejects it they're condemning their own selves it shouldn't bother us they're saying to them, they're not worthy. I mean, how, how nice do you have to be? You're going to reject something, somebody coming nicely, somebody coming all because it's a message that you don't like to hear, you're going to reject it? I don't, they're, they're, they're condemning themselves before God. So in verse 39, he says, And these all, speaking of those mentioned in Hebrews 11, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise underline that phrase received not the promise these that were mentioned here in the scriptures in just this chapter they were led to believe that god was going to fulfill something and they believed that it would happen but they died never seeing it they didn't receive the promise then he says in verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect or complete. Heavenly Father, I praise and thank you, Lord, for this time you've given us to come together. Thank you so much for the opportunity to preach your word. I pray that you please, that you would stir our hearts, that you would set our souls on fire, that you would, that you would put a, a fire under our feet. Help us to, 
to realize what the world needs. Stir up the embers of love in our heart for you. I pray you please keep my mind focused on what you want me to say. I pray you please rebuke the evil one, that he would be incarcerated and cast out of this, off of this property and not have any, any ability to distract or to, to sow his discord. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you please bring your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit. You promised that you would supply our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And we need your Holy Spirit to teach us something and to stir our hearts. This week, you know that we're going to meet people. We don't know who we're going to meet, but we're going to cross paths with certain people. And we, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. Please stir our hearts and motivate us tonight. I pray, Lord, please keep my mind focused on you. Please take me up and direct me, Lord. Teach us something from your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The great inventor, Charles Kettering, suggested that we must learn to fail intelligently. He said, once you failed, analyze the problem and find out why. Because each failure is one more step leading up to the cathedral of success. The only time you don't want to fail is the last time you try. That's a good point. It is said that Thomas Edison performed more than 50,000 experiments before he succeeded in producing a storage battery. We might assume that the famous inventor would have had some serious doubts along the way. But when asked if he ever became discouraged working so long without results, Edison replied, Results? Why, I know 50,000 50, things that don't work. <laughs> now that's the way to look at it, amen? Try, if, you, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Remember Vinko Bogatej? You don't? Oh, you don't? How, how many have ever seen... Back in the 80s and 90s, ABC, Wide World of Sports. You ever, saw, you ever saw that? And that intro? Okay, let me tell you about Vinko Bogatej, okay? He was the ski jumper from Yugoslavia who, while competing in the 1970 World, Skiing Fly, World Ski Flying Championship in Oberstdorf, West Germany, fell off the takeoff ramp and landed on his head. Ever since the accident, he had, had ever since the accident has been used to highlight the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat on ABC's Wide World of Sports. Bogatej was hospitalized after the spill, but he recovered and now works in a foundry in Yugoslavia. Doug Wilson, a producer for ABC, interviewed him for a special anniversary edition of the of the show. When we told him he's been on the program ever since 1970. Wilson says he couldn't believe it. The producer said, yeah, you appear more than 130 times a year. <laughs> it was his failure that made him well known. It was his failure. <clears throat> here's, here's an interesting take on someone's failure. The prize for the most useless weapon of all times goes to the Russians. They invented the dog mine. The dog mine. The plan was to use trained dogs and, and, and associate food with the underside of tanks in hope that they would run hungrily beneath the advancing panzer divisions of the Germans. Bombs were strapped to the dog's back, but unfortunately the dogs associated food only with Russian tanks. <laughs> the plan was begun the first day of the Russian involvement in World War II and abandoned the next day. See, the, the dogs with the bombs on their back, they forced an entire Soviet division to retreat. <laughs> Get away from those dogs. Amen. Isn't it funny how for some their failure, or rather their unrealized goal, it defined their future and how they're remembered. Hebrews 11 is known as the, to the believers as a hall of faith. It lists some of the greatest heroes of our faith. Yet they all have one thing in common. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Hold your place there in Hebrews 11. We're definitely going to come back. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Let's see what that common denominator is. Genesis 3.15, if you know the chapter of Genesis 3, you know that's the fall, that when man fell into sin. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is God speaking to Adam, Adam Eve, and the serpent, and telling them how things are going to be in the future. And God prophesies that even though man has fallen into sin, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and the, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head. The seed of woman shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He promised that he would send eventually the Messiah, the anointed one, to come take away the sins of the world. He promised them. That promise... The promise was that God, after man's fall into sin, had spoken of his Messiah, his anointed one, whom he would send to crush the head of the serpent and deliver man from sin forever. If you go back with me to Hebrews chapter 11, we have here in Hebrews chapter 11 a list of some of the greatest heroes of the faith, yet they all have one thing in common. As a Christian, as a New Testament Christian, what is it that we look forward to? The next thing that we believe to be on the calendar of God, the next big event, what is it that we look forward to? Starts with an R and ends in apture. Can you guess? The rapture, that's what we look forward to. Well, back there in the Old Testament, they look forward to the first coming of the Messiah, this promise of Genesis 3.15 being fulfilled. The Messiah coming, being the sacrifice. As we try to decipher the times and, and try to dis discover when possibly the Lord Jesus might come a second time, they were wondering how he was going to come the first time. That was the promise that they looked forward to. But in Hebrews 11 and verse 13, what does it say? It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Let's look at them. Go to verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered a, unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Abel, he showed the Lord who he trusted in by sacrificing one of, the, one of his flock. But even him, when, when, he, when, when, when given the choice and, and, and willing to go against what the pressure of his brother who brought the fruits of the ground. I can imagine that Cain was a, was a pretty, forceful, pretty forceful person. You, you see how he reacted whenever he was confronted of his sin. Makes me wonder what kind of personality he was. Was Abel more meek? Was, was Abel more, more gentle and he was willing to, to work with these animals? But yet he said, I'm going to give what God told me to give. And what was the result of that? He died without receiving the promise. Verse 5, it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. It was not found because God had translated him. Before, before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That he pleased God. Enoch was walked so closely with God that God... Somebody, one preacher said that, that God and Enoch, they were talking one day and they just were walking and walking and walking. And Enoch said, wow, it's getting late in the day. And God said, hey, you know what? You know, uh, you're closer to my house than, than it is your house. Why not just stay over at my house? And, and he just kept, kept going. And God translated him and, 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 and he never saw death. And even the Bible says he walked with God for 300 years. How long have you been walking with God? Enoch. He probably, we could probably put all of our walks with God together and still not equal 300 years, yeah. right? Yeah. But what, did, what did he not get for it? He didn't see God's promise happen. He never saw the Messiah come. He never saw this promise. He never saw it come to fruition in his day. Go to verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. 
by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So we see here that Noah, for 120 years, he preached righteousness and he built this ark and he kept going against the, the tide of, of wickedness. The Bible says that, that the earth was filled with violence before in the days of Noah. And Noah, he went against this. And he, he preached righteousness. He prepared this ark. He saved human civilization. And what did he get for it? He died without receiving the promise. He died without receiving the promise. Verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. Abraham left his kindred for an own unknown inheritance. Who would do that? Who would do that? Who, 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 would, who would leave their Ur of the Chaldees and everything that was set up for them to just, just keep, keep the, 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 the wheel turning and just enjoy the, the fruits of, of what's going on? Don't change it. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump out here and I'm going to go off on my own, Abraham says, and I'm just going to trust God. You would think, wow, that's... That's a point for Abraham. Surely, surely he would be worthy of, 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 of seeing the promise come to pass. He left his kindred for an unknown inheritance. He looked all his life for that heavenly city. He was willing to walk around and, and travel as a nomad and, and live in tents all of his life. Don't you think God would have been moved because of that? But what happened? Abraham dies. He doesn't see the promise. He dies without seeing the promise. Verse 11, it says, Through faith also Sarah received, herself received strength to, con to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Sarah, she judged God faithful. She was, she was in grandma years when the Lord gave her. She was in great grandma years. When the Lord gave her a child. And she believed God could do it. She received strength. You would think that surely this was merit enough for her to, 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 to see the promise of God come to pass. Nope, she died without receiving the promise. She died without seeing the promise. Let's go to verse 17. In verse 17, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Wow, wow, Abraham, what a man of faith to, to attempt to offer your son because God indicated that you should do that. He offers up his son, Isaac, as an offering to the Lord. He, he, God spared his son miraculously and, and, and told, told Abraham, no, don't do it. Receives him back up off the altar. He believed that God could have raised Isaac from the dead. That was, that's a pretty amazing thing to believe at that point in time. It had never happened before. Somebody raised him from the dead? No. Once a person dies, they die. That's, that's what had happened all through this time of history. But Abraham, he, his mind was open as, you know what? If God told me to do this, I believe God could raise him back up. Surely, surely that was married enough to receive the promise. But no, Abraham at 175 years old, he dies. Doesn't see the promise. Verse 20. Verse 20, it says, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. What was the result of his faith in God's promises? He, did, he died without receiving the promise. Verse 21 talks about Jacob. He blesses Joseph and his sons and worship God, and he dies without receiving the promise. You would think that someone would get up, give up on God by now, wouldn't you? But no, they don't. Verse 22, it talks about Joseph. How he prophesied of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. He believed God. He believed that God was going to give them the, land, the promised land. He died never seeing the promises. 400 years pass. 400 years pass from Genesis 50 to Exodus chapter 1. And in verse 23, we see that Moses' parents, Amram and Jochebed, 
They risked their lives to, to spare Moses. Surely, not obeying the king's command and sparing their child, surely that's merit enough to see this promise come to pass. Nope, they died without receiving the promise. Go to verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a se season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. You see here, Moses, he refuses the life of, of an Egyptian prince, chooses to suffer with God's people and wander in the wilderness with them. Surely this was merit enough. I mean, think about that. He gave up all of his political position in Egypt to go be a, a, a gypsy, a nomad in the wilderness for 40 years. Gave it all up. Gave it all up. Surely this is merit enough for him to be able to see the Messiah come in his day. But no, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Verse 29 talks about the children of Israel, how they walked through the Red Sea on dry land, and they all died without receiving the promise of the Messiah coming. Verse 30 talks about the second generations of Israelites, how they witnessed the walls of Jericho fall down. They, they believed God. They were prophesied to, to, to have been eaten by the inhabitants of the, the, the promised land. But they grew up in the wilderness, and then they witnessed the walls of Jericho fall, but these all died without receiving God's promise. In verse 31, it talks about Rahab. Surely, Rahab, a person who heard about the, the Red Sea incident and heard about Og and Bashan and what the, the, the Israelites did in Bashan, and, and she feared her heart. She feared the, the Israelites. That Those events happened 40 years earlier. It tells me that she was a little girl at the time or, or a young lady at the time, and she heard and feared and, and quaked, and for 40 years she feared God. Surely fearing God would be merit enough for her to see the promise. But no, she died without receiving the promise. You would think that for what they endured, somebody would be rewarded with the promise, wouldn't you? Verse 32 through 38 talks about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and many others that suffered untold suffering, persecution, and torture. They all died without receiving God's promise. None of these heroes received the promise here. They did not receive the promise. These heroes of our faith all have one thing in common. They died without receiving God's promise. Even King Hezekiah, a king who brought about a wonderful revival in Israel during Isaiah's day had this to say. Jot the scripture down. Isaiah 38, 1 through 8. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. This is Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 38, 1 through 8. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord, and said, Remember thou, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. This is what Hezekiah is telling God. I've, I've given you my all. I, I've... I've done my best to walk before you. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city, and this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundown of Ahaz ten degrees backward. So the sun returned 10 degrees by, by the, which degrees it was gone down. So God healed Hezekiah of his sickness. But look at what Hezekiah wrote about during his sickness. He says in verse 9, he says, The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick and was recovered of his sickness. As Hezekiah says, I said in the cutting off of my days, I shall go to the gates of the grave. I am deprived of the residue of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, even the Lord, speaking of the Messiah, in the land of the living. Hezekiah was looking for the Messiah to come in his day. Amen. This man who brought great revival in Israel. He was anticipating the fulfillment of God's Genesis 3.15 promise in his day. 
he lamented that he would miss it. He would miss it. You see, he wanted to see and feel and touch the Messiah, the Lamb of God, that would be coming to take away the sins of the world. But the result, he died without receiving God's promise. Why in the world do we call these mentioned in Hebrews 11 heroes? Why don't we call them zeros? Why don't we call them fools? We're going to use our Bibles tonight, so go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. As you're turning there, I'm going to read. We'll just read it together. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. It says, <clears throat> Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. But what if it only read like this? Ask, seek, knock, period. Go to chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22, it says, And all things, Matthew 21, 22, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. But what if it read like this? And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing period. Nothing more. No promise. Would you do it? Would you do it? Go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. John 14 verse 13. John 14, 13, it says, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. But what if it read like this? And whatsoever ye shall ask, ask in my name, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything, in my, anything, ask in my name, period. No hope, no promise, no, no, no indication that even, it would even be heard or fulfilled or answered in any way go to chapter 15 and verse 7 the next chapter it says if ye abide in me and my words abide in you ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you isn't that great we get hope from those promises but what if it read like this if ye abide in me and my words abide in you ye shall ask what you will period nothing else if ye abide in me and my words abide in you you'll have the privilege of asking Are we not addicted to getting something from God? God would be very much in his rights to say, you know, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you can have the privilege of asking. I'm not promising you anything beyond that. But you could, give, you could have the privilege to ask me, to talk to me. Go to verse 16 of that same chapter. It says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. But what if it only read like this? Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Go. Shoot. Get busy. Into the fields. Get to work, you slave. Second Chronicles says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And what an encouragement and a comfort that is for us. But what if it only read, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Period. Nothing more. Yeah. Would we do it? 
Why in the world, going back to Hebrews chapter 11, why in the world do we call these mentioned in Hebrews 11 heroes and not zeros and not fools? Go back to Hebrews 11, go to verse 40, the last verse of the chapter. It says, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. It says, God having provided some better thing for us. What better thing has God provided for us? Here it is. Here it is, the opportunity to be an inspiration. The opportunity to be an inspiration. Is it not inspiring whenever somebody is willing to die for their faith and not have received the promise? You can't help but look inside that person and, 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 and know they must have believed it for real. Why? What would drive a person? What would drive a person to, to be willing to die for their faith? If you've ever heard the story of Vanya, Vanya is a Russian soldier. Vanya. And you hear his story, and he prays, Lord, give me more time to pray. And he's in the Russian army. It's the communist Russian army. And he is late one morning to roll call. He tries to, to tell his commanding officer it won't happen again. His commanding officer keeps pushing. What were you doing? What were you doing? Why were you late? That's a lack of discipline. What were you doing? He finally breaks down, not wanting to lie. He breaks down and says, I was praying. Praying? What? Praying? If you're in the Russian army, there, you, 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 you must sign papers that say there is no God. He was forced to try to sign those papers, but he refused. And so they made him stay out in the cold. Ten degrees. Negative ten degrees. In summer dress. And he was wondering, God, what are you doing? And the Holy Spirit said, don't you remember what you asked for? You asked for more time to pray. I'm giving it to you. You can stay, you, you get to stay up all night until two o'clock in the morning and pray out in the cold. And I'm keeping you warm. Other men would have crumpled to their feet, but I'm keeping you strengthened and warm. His barrack mates, they saw this. They said, wow, his God must be real because he's keeping him warm. He should be dead. He should be frozen to death. But his God is keeping him warm. And they would go to him and say, Vanya, would you pray for my family over here, they're having pro problems. Would you pray for this over here? And his, his bunkmates, they were telling him all these things to pray for. He's getting more time to pray. He was an inspiration to those in his platoon and in his dormitories. I want to make three statements. Number one, as air is to the lungs, so is inspiration to the soul. As air is to the lungs, so is inspiration to the soul. It lights a fire inside the heart of another and gives them an energy to go on when they have no strength in themselves to take another step. But your life story, your trial, your heroic struggle, not even victory, your heroic struggle fired them up to keep going, if not just for another day. God has given us a chance to inspire others. That's why these who are in the hall of faith, that's why we admire them, because they believe something, and even though they didn't receive the promise, they still hung on to that belief, which tells me it, it, there must have been something so for real about it that they would be willing to not recant it and not give it up. Your struggle is not in vain. When someone, when someone prays for patience, do you think God gives them patience, or does he give them an opportunity to be patient? If someone prays for courage, does God give them courage or does he give them opportunities to be courageous? If, God, if someone prays for their family to be closer, do you think God zaps them with a warm, fuzzy feeling or does he give them opportunities to love each other? As air is to the lungs, so is inspiration to the soul. The fight that you show in your particular struggle is fueling the fire of someone else who is watching you in that struggle. It's fueling their fire. They're getting inspired because you're willing to fight. 
Hebrews 11.40, again, it says God has provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be perfect. That better thing is the opportunity to inspire others. Number two, faith that inspires, uh, faith that inspires is a faith that still believes in God and considers, that, considers what he might be doing outside the realm of human understanding, reasoning, and sight for the purpose of gaining the maximum honor and glory possible. Do you know God wants to do good works too? He wants to do good works too. And so he will work out situations just like the, the children of Israel and Moses saying, uh, telling Pharaoh, let my people go. And how did it go for the children of Israel after Moses started negotiating for the release of the Israelites? It got worse. And after, after uh, Abraham was promised the, 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 the child that he would have that would be the seed of promise, how many years did he have to wait? He was 75 when he got the promise. You would think a logical and a humanly logical God would say, you know what? He's getting older. We need to get this baby coming on like pretty soon. But God said, no, no, let him get old and decrepit. Let him get old and frail and feeble. And I want to give him a child then. That way I can get the glory. God wants to do good works too. God wants to do new works. New works. This new thing I will do, God says. I want to do a new work. Just think about God and Job. You read that testimony, who brought up Job's name? It wasn't Job. It wasn't Satan. It was God himself. Faith that inspires is a faith that believes in God and considers what he might be doing outside the realm of human understanding, reasoning, and sight for the purpose of gaining the maximum honor and glory possible. So the question is this. Are you willing to be used by God, like Job was, to shut Satan up and prove him wrong? Are you willing to be used? Are you willing to be that living sacrifice, as Paul says in Romans? That's the bigger picture. Do you have a faith that inspires? Do you have a faith that inspires others? Do you have a faith that inspires God? Has your faith gotten God's attention? Or do you give God an ultimatum? God, my way, or I'm quitting on you. Aren't you glad that God doesn't do the same for us? <laughs> my way, I'm quitting on you, little human. I'll take your little breath and you'll come up and meet me. Reminds me of that Russian astronaut went up into space, comes back down to Earth. He says the press to the press, by the way, you say that you, you Christians, you say that there's a God. I went up to I went up to, to space. I looked around. There's no God. Somebody said, step out of that space capsule. You would have met him. <laughs> What could God do or not do that would get you to quit on God? If God doesn't do this, I'm, I'm done. What could God do or not do that could get you to quit on God? Brother Tony, if we quit on God, what, what life is there? It's like Jesus asking the disciples, will you also go away? And the disciples, we ought to have the same response as the disciples. Who else has the words of life? I don't see anyone else preaching this, this message and doing the miracles and, and, and the, as the Son of God. Where else are we going to go? So we quit on God and then what? We'll be, we'll be like Jeremiah, a fire shot up in our bones. You know, you, 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 we know we're not going to be happy if we quit on God. Or do you have the faith that causes, causes you to say like David did in 1 Samuel 17, 29, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? He, David wasn't focused on the size of his giant. He was focused and he had already seen the size of his God. And then that's what we need to focus on. He was asking this because he couldn't believe others hadn't seen it as well. Is there not a cause? What are we doing here, army of Israel? Are we here just trying to profit off of, 
you know, all the all those guys who were in the army and, and they were listening to Goliath banter and all of his challenges, they could have been home working the fields and helping shoulder the load back in the fields. But no, the families, they were bringing, what was David there, there, there in the first place? He was bringing food and supplies from his family. Instead of working the fields, he was bringing it to the army. And that's how he came across Goliath. Is there not a cause? Are you here for a reason? What if, they, what if David had not killed the giant? Would it not have been a more inspiring story to have that kind of faith in God that you're willing to throw your life away in an attempt to avenge him because you count him worthy of your life being thrown away in that way? What if David hadn't killed Goliath? What if that spear had pierced through him and he would have died? What a glorious death. Would it not have been? Or do you have the faith to say like Esther in Esther 4.16, if I perish, I perish. I put my life on the line. One of the reasons why mature people stop growing and learning is that they become less and less willing to risk it all. Got to protect, got to protect. If I perish, I perish. God knows the amount of footprints, the steps you're going to make. He knows. He has that number. And when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. There's, the, you could, you could, I, I, how many times have you heard about somebody eating so healthy and exercising all the time and they kill over? You're like, huh? Man, if, if good eating does that to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live it up. It's like it doesn't make sense. God knows. You know, Esther, she could have kept quiet. And been secure in her life in the king's house. She had favor with the king. He would have protected her, most likely. Why not keep quiet, Esther? Why chance possibly upsetting the comfortable life that you've been given? Why? Why take the risk? Surely God will understand, but no. She put her life out there. She would have ended up like Barak and Deborah. Barak, if you look at his story, he didn't have show confidence in the Lord. And even though his army got the victory, the glory, the opportunity to inspire others, went to a housewife, jail. The opportunity to inspire the people around, it went to jail, a housewife, and not to the captain of the army. Or do you have faith that causes you to say like Job in Job 13, 15, though he slay me. Yet will I trust him. Amen. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job recognized that his life and existence were tools to be used in God's hands. My mere existence is a tool in your hands, God. Revelation says we're here for his pleasure. It was not God's responsibility to explain beforehand all of his plans and get Job's approval. It was Joe's responsibility to recognize God's nature, see him for what he is and has done, and surrender himself to the pleasure of his creator, God. Whatever you want, God, I'm here for your pleasure. And so all of these that we call heroes had something in common. They all lived their life believing that God will fulfill his promise in their day. But as we read in verse 39 of Hebrews 11, these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. And what was that better thing? It was the opportunity to inspire others, an opportunity to tell their stories to others, and so on, an opportunity to be challenged to replicate their testimony in our own life. How many of us have, have come across this, this great challenge in our life, and in our minds, Goliath comes to mind? And we're like David. Bring it on. And we get inspiration because this little guy, how many times have we heard in, in football analogies, it's a David and Goliath battle, this small college over here and this big college over here. And it's all, you see, David slice. And they use this analogy over and over, the little guy beating the big guy. It's inspiring. It's inspiring. It's an opportunity to replicate their testimony in our own life. How many people have gone through struggles and, 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 and they get, that, they, they get that, that, that report from the doctor, you've got cancer. And they fall into that despair 
And one of the things that helps buoy them through that whole treatment, Job. 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 Have you considered my servant Job? Or they're betrayed by sinners. They're suffering for the good that they're doing, and they can't help but think about Jesus. And understand that Jesus, he suffered the same thing as well. What better thing is it for us? It's an opportunity to be an inspiration to others, an opportunity for others to see with their own eyes our struggle and be inspired by us. Because as air is to the lungs, so is inspiration to the soul. And a faith that inspires is a faith that still believes in God and considers what he might be doing outside the realm of human understanding and reasoning and sight for the purpose of gaining him honor and glory. And the question then is, am I willing to be used in that way? In 1894, an English teacher noted on a teenager's report card, a conspicuous lack of success. That student was Winston Churchill. In 1902, the poetry editor of Atlantic Monthly returned a stack of poems with this note, our magazine has no room for your vigorous verse. It was addressed to Robert Frost. <laughs> In 1905, the University of Bern in Germany turned down a doctoral dissertation as irrelevant and fanciful. The writer of that paper was Albert Einstein. One ball player set the major league record for strikeouts with 1,316, and the same player set a record for five consecutive strikeouts in a World Series game. The holder of both those records, can you guess it? Babe Ruth one of the greatest names of baseball. Hebrews 11.40 says, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. And what better thing is that for us? The opportunity to inspire others. Amen. By living out our faith, by suffering what we suffer, by, by gutting through it and letting God sustain us with his grace and the world sees and says, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. I wouldn't do that. If I was going through, I would quit. But they see you not quitting, and they're fired up to keep going. And you're able to be a testimony for Christ because you don't receive the promise. You don't get the answer to prayer that you're looking for. But people are watching, and you're able to inspire them. And as air is to the lungs, so is inspiration to the soul. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord, for these heroes, Lord, that you've given us that fire us up that stir our hearts, that give us hope. Give us hope to, to see what you can do in our lives and see what you can, what you can do through our lives for the purpose of, of enlarging your kingdom, of, of bringing yourself honor and glory, of, of making you happy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I pray, Heavenly Father, you please help us to, to look at our lives and the struggles that we have and the battles that we face and, and realize that even though we don't receive the promise, we ought to have the vision and ask ourselves, Lord, what bigger thing are you doing? And may we come to the, to the conclusion that, yes, I'm willing, God, for you to use me in that way. If you want to use my life to bring yourself honor and glory in this way, then I'm willing. You're worthy. You're so worthy. Lord, help us to learn to surrender and not fight. Please, Lord, help us to see Help us to see your purpose and what you're trying to do. Please forgive us for resisting. Please forgive us for, for, for not wanting, not being willing. Lord, we need your help. I pray that you'd please help our testimony, help our life, help it to be a, sh a shining, bright light in the world around us. Lord, it doesn't matter all the education that we have over the University of Michigan or Michigan State. It doesn't matter all of the highfalutin 
facts that they fill their heads with, your word is more powerful than it all. And may our lives, may our lives be used to shine the light in our area to inspire others and to point them to Jesus Christ. We're going to pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Come have Miss Melissa play hymn of invitation. The altar is open. If the Lord has touched your heart, spoken to your heart, challenged your heart, how about you come and tell the Lord, Lord, I, I, I'm willing to be used like Job was with my trial, with my, with my burden, with, with my, the, the things in my life that are not exactly what I would choose. I'm willing to be used by you as an inspiration to others, to point people to Jesus Christ, to cause more people to trust in you. Let's pray. Sure, Blue Psalm, we can go to number 400. No, number 400, we'll sing the first and last verse of I Wish I Had Given Him More. We'll sing the first and last verse of number 400, 400. Number 400, join me on the first. By and by when I look on His face, Beautiful face, thorn shadowed face. By and by, when I look on his face, I'll wish I had given him more, more, so much more. 
my life that I e'er gave before by and by when I look on his face I'll wish I had given him more in the light of that heavenly place light from his face beautiful face in the light of that heavenly place I wish I had given him more, more, so much more, more treasures unbound him, for him I adore by and by when I look on his face. I'll wish I had given him more. Amen. Amen. I love that song. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. When we stand before him and give account for our lives. That's, that'll be our hearts. Our hearts cry. I wish I would have given him more. You know that trial that he, he was sending me? He was giving me an opportunity to, to inspire. He was giving me an opportunity to be a blessing to others by, by my struggle, by he, seeing, them seeing his grace through my life, carrying me through this. One thing at the end of my life, I don't want to look back and ever have to say, although I will, but I like to keep the times down to, to the least amount possible. I don't want to ever have to look back and say, I wish I would have. I wish I would have. I wish I would have. I want to be able to say, I'm glad I did. <laughs> I'm glad I did. That ought to be. That, that means that we're going to have to, the trials and the afflictions and the, the life situation that God brings our way, we're just going to have to, Lord, hold my hand through it. Hold my hand through it. That's the only way I'm going to be able to get through it. Amen. Amen. Let's bow for prayer and we'll be dismissed. Preacher, do you mind praying for us, please?